try and meld my experience of working at Maryland Department of Natural Resources for 15 years um, on, on sea level rise and, and climate change with my experience over the last two years at the Chesapeake Bay program and with NOAA's Chesapeake Bay office working very broadly on climate change as Bill mentioned at the, at the watershed scale, um, predominantly on water quality planning and thinking about climate impacts. With my most recent experience over the last five weeks, um, uh, thinking about how to apply um, my knowledge and expertise um, about climate change, sea level rise, and my planning degree, my urban planning degree, you know, that I received in 1998, you know, probably almost, you know, 25 years ago um, at, it, at an installation level. So bear with me. Um, but uh, we've heard a lot of good presentations this morning already that talk about, you know, climate change the global perspective, some, some, some nuances of, of particular aspects of climate change on sea level rise and storm surge. So Brian did a nice job of talking about, you know, collective planning at the local, at the community scale or at the, at the county scale. I'm going to broaden it back out a little bit for you, but just talk about the Chesapeake Bay. And this, as you know, is, uh, is a changing landscape. You know, we've got this historic rate of sea level rise with, with rates that are all, almost up to 10 feet now projected um, in the worst case scenario over the next 100 years. We've seen observed temperatures of increased water temperature within the Chesapeake. And we've seen, as, as noted by, you know, Hurricane Isabel Sandy, you know, a number of storms uh, that these, these extreme events are increasing in frequency, I mean, and, and intensity. Um, Brian mentioned um, that we're also seeing changes in, in the intensity in the short duration, you know, um, uh, precipitation events. These are the preci precipitation events that are often referred to as rain bombs. Um, the Northeast has seen almost a 71% increase in these types of events, and these are becoming of major concern to, to co coastal communities and inland communities, you know, metropolitan communities dealing with storm water. Um, some of the impacts, just to kind of give you some nice pretty pictures and then we'll get into the meat. Um, you know, sea level rise on the Maryland's eastern shore is resulting in loss of vital habitat, you know, inner pond formation within our coastal wetland systems, die off of loblolly pine. Um, we're seeing increased shoreline erosion throughout the Chesapeake Bay, increases, you know, resulting in land loss, um, <coughs> increasing sedimentation and nutrients and, and into the Chesapeake. We've seen impacts in our coastal communities. There are some nice pictures shown already about the coastal flooding or nuisance flooding. This is a picture from Hurricane Isabel in 2003, downtown Annapolis. Um, Hurricane, this is a picture from after Hurricane Sandy, impacts to public infrastructure in, in, in um, Crisfield. Um, impacts to private infrastructure. I took these photos actually on a tour after Hurricane Isabel in 2013. So there's concerns about our private infrastructure. And then in my new home at the, at the Naval Academy, um, you know, communities throughout Maryland and throughout, you know, the, along the Mid-Atlantic are beginning to deal with um, increase in nuisance flooding. So adapting to all these changes, and, and I have a lot of other slides. I, I was going to mention that I recently gave the same presentation over an hour and a half to the Maryland Outdoor Educators um, about how to integrate science into, into planning and policy. So I'm trying to get it all down for 15 minutes. But we have a lot of other impacts of climate change in terms of you know, impacts on our cold, cold water resources, um, you know, urban heat. Um, drought, so in agriculture, and the impacts on both human consumption as well as agriculture. So I don't want you to think I don't there, that those issues are not um, of concern when it comes to climate change. But just for today, we're going to talk a little bit more about sea level rise and some of the coastal impacts. But when you look broadly at climate adapt or climate impacts, and you think about how to adapt, uh, recognizing mitigation is extremely important, but so is adaptation. Um, there is this planning puzzle, and I've actually been using the slide since I think 2008, and Ian helped uh, put together some nice graphics for the state when I was working um, with the Maryland Climate Change Commission. But really, I still like this slide because I think it really shows that whether you're working on transportation planning, shoreline buffer area management, if you're working on shore protection, whether you do land use planning, whether you work on building codes or floodplain management, whether you do natural resource management, or whether you do emergency planning and preparedness, or whether you as a planner work with others that work on those things, there is a component to how you adapt and how you can integrate climate considerations into all of those practices. So thinking about that, with whatever puzzle piece you're working on at any given stage or with whatever hat you're wearing, 
Um, this is my summary of a planning process for how you would begin to walk through integrating science into that planning or policy process. So the first key is to re really review the state of the science, and the state of the science whether, when it comes to climate change or sea level rise is ever-changing, it's emerging, there's a tremendous amount of research out there if you just think about sea level rise alone. Um, then you need to sort of assess the vulnerability of, of whatever you're working on, if it's a resource or an asset or a, 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 a social community, uh, to that vulner to vulnerability over time. Then you need to identify your critical information gaps and begin to fill those. Brian gave a nice example of where they've identified some critical information needs that they have to help plan at that community level. Um, then, then the hard part really and the most important thing as you move forward is to prioritize key issues of concern. And here I'm going to um, use another Brian example is that you know, someone brought up storm, storm water. Well, that's an issue of concern, but right now they're going to focus on sea level. So you have to sort of begin to to prioritize your impacts. There's a lot of impacts, there's a lot of things that, that we need to plan for, but you have to begin to, to distill down that list. And then there's, you also have to grow your list back out when you want to explore this full range of, of potential adaptation strategies, because there's a lot of strategies out there that can help you reduce risk. Um, but you have then have to think about how are you going to implement those? What are the mechanisms that you can use to implement um, and, and, and build resilience or adapt in, what, in, in the confines of your existing institutional framework. Um, and, and so this is where I think planners and, and people that are looking at the big picture really should spend a lot of time thinking about is what are those opportunities or mechanisms? Are you updating your comprehensive plan? Are you updating your state hazard mitigation plan? Are you, you know, where are those opportunities where you can begin to instill uh, some of this planning into the process? And then the final step is, you know, recommending specific action strategies. And there's going to be short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategies that you can recommend and that would be implemented over time. Once you have those action strategies, you can step back up to here and wait for those opportunities or those mechanisms so that you can, you know, have the plan, take the plan off the shelf and begin to implement when the opportunity presents itself. There are um, a number of tools that can help uh, communities. There are a number in the state, uh, through the state coastal program at Maryland Department of Natural Resources, but there's also the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, which if you, you could spend hours or weeks on this toolkit, um, it houses a tremendous amount of data and, and a tremendous, tre tremendous amount of resources, but also case examples um, from around the country. So I'm just going to touch on two case studies very shortly, just to kind of give you a feel for some of the things uh, or some of the projects that I've been involved with. Um, one, just to illustrate some of these points, one was the 2010 Chesapeake Bay TMDL, and this, this, was, uh, this is where what I was focused on when I worked for NOAA uh, for the last two years. Um, the 2010 uh, TMDL, when it was signed, this is the, the Bay Pollution Diet. I'm sure are most fam people familiar with the 2010 Chesapeake Bay TMDL, watershed planning, watershed implementation plans. Um, so in 2010, when the TMDL was signed, there was a commitment or there was a recognition that climate change was an issue that should be taken into consideration with respect to watershed planning and, 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 and examining and, and, and assessing um, nutrients and, and sediment loads in the Chesapeake. But we didn't know enough about the science or potentially the impacts of climate change on how it would affect source loads. So in 2010, they made a commitment that during the midpoint assessment in 2017, halfway between 2010 and 2025, um, they would assess the impact of climate change on sediment loads and nutrient loads entering the Chesapeake Bay, both from a watershed perspective as well as the, how the water body itself, the estuary, was responding to those increases in loads, but also changes in temperature and loss of wetlands and, and sea level rise within the bay itself. And then they would lay out some policy, uh, potential policy options and go through a what, what resulted in a fairly lengthy but vigorous policy debate on how to address uh, climate change with respect to watershed planning uh, within, the water, within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So you can imagine that there was a tremendous amount of science uh, that informed this, po this process from the vulnerability assessment through the planning to the policy and the ultimate decisions that were made um, just a few months ago. Um, as I mentioned on the watershed side, um, you know, there's two sides to the Chesapeake Bay program model. There's a watershed model that informs the source loads that enter the Chesapeake Bay. From a climate change perspective, 
They looked at increased air temperature, increased precipitation volume and intensity, changes in vaporous transpiration, and changes in, in carbon uh, dioxide uh, or CO2 entering, and how those forces um, would increase in, in many cases the amount of, of nutrients and sediment that would it would be would, that would enter into in, into the estuary. On the water quality sediment transport model side, so this is what's called the estuarine model. Um, we looked, we took those increased watershed flows and loads <coughs> due to climate change, factored in increased te water temperature due to climate change, uh, loss of tidal marshes due to sea level rise, and increased sea level rise itself that was changing the, the circulation uh, patterns within the Chesapeake, um, as well as uh, sea level rise was bringing in more increased uh, oxygen, oxygen enriched seawater and changing the, the, the stratification due to mixing. How all those things work together um, and, 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 and what the results were in terms of potential new changes in nutrient and sediment loads uh, between now and 2025. So in very quick summary, uh, there's about a 4% increase in, in nitrogen and a 9% and increase in phosphorus in terms of, of expected loads between now and 20, between 1985 and 2025 due to climate change. So the, the program and the partnership really took those um, potential, those projected increases in nutrients and sediment loads, and then began this difficult process of, of how to address those changes that were projected from a policy and a planning uh, you know, perspective. And then what would ultimately be the requirements at the, at the local level for addressing those increased loads or those changes due to climate change. So as you can imagine from a planning perspective and a policy perspective, these were pretty complicated and lengthy discussions, and they re but they had to rely on the soundness of the science um, about our understanding of climate change as well as our understanding of how the model was incorporating and, and factoring in those changes. So we, were look we asked, really asked two questions, or how will the impacts affect of climate change affect the effectiveness of existing water quality best management practices over time. So not only were we looking at how climate change was going to increase the source loads, we're also looking about how climate change could impact our existing practices we're using to do Chesapeake Bay restoration. And then we spent a lot of time on what the, what the, what the options were uh, to address change. So about a month or two ago, uh, the partnership decided that um, in phase three watershed implementation plans, jurisdictions will now uh, in need to incorporate a, a, a narrative strategy on their steps to address climate change within their plans. Um, and that the partnership is going to, over the next two years, spend more time um, on the science and the application of that science and informing the model to ensure that it's, it's scientifically valid uh, moving forward so we have a better understanding of the impacts over time. So it's kind of a dual approach. The partnership recognized that the impacts of climate change are serious enough and that the projections are of significant concern that they want uh, jurisdictions around the watershed to begin to take or plans and begin planning for those impacts and how they're going to address those impacts. But they also recognize that we need to spend more time on the science and learning more about the impacts, but also how we can respond, if that makes sense. So the second case study um, is, is really um, the work that I'm doing now and that I'm, that I'm just beginning at the Naval Academy at Naval Support Activity in Annapolis um, on nuisance and minor flooding and sea level rise. So um, many of you uh, know about the Naval Academy. It, the Naval Academy is the major um, you know, uh, use of Naval Support Activity in Annapolis, which is the formal Naval Station. It's made up of both the lower and upper yard in the city of Annapolis mm -hmm. and then uh, a large complex in the North Severn. So, <clears throat> as mentioned, um, you know, Naval, uh, Annapolis has seen almost, it sees about 40 uh, days of nuisance flooding a year. It's extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, the Naval Academy uh, suffered significant damage from Hurricane Isabel. And like installations, naval installations, as well as, you know, coastal communities along the Mid-Atlantic, uh, uh, the Navy is very concerned about the impacts of, of sea level rise and nuisance flooding and protecting um, its assets, but also how uh, these ish impacts will affect the overall mission. So um, in 2015, the Naval Academy, um, put to, after a congressional hearing, um, put together a sea level rise advisory council um, to really look at the science, assess the vulnerability, 
and then begin to lay out the, the plan forward on, on how to address both nuisance flooding as well as long-term impacts associated with sea level rise and coastal flooding. So I've, I've joined the Naval Academy and, and, and Naval Support Activity just in the last five weeks um, to, to work with the, with the Sea Level Rise Council as well as work with the community of Annapolis on sea level rise and coastal flooding issues because with anybody who works in a community know that there are a lot of partners that need to engage. So as the community planning liaison, my role is really to work with the community as well as with, with the Naval Station on these issues so to make sure that we're a good neighbor and that we're working together um, on, the, on, these, on these issues which are fairly immense. So we'll be using, and, then, and you know, I'm stepping in, in in the midst of a, of a planning process with the Sea Level Rise Advisory Committee that has already you know, been initiated over the last few years. But it's really my thought that, that you know, a number of these steps have already been undertaken um, you know, to date, um, but we're still really you know, beginning to explore um, what those potential adaptation strategies are. There are structural solutions, there's non-structural solutions, there's um, you know, changes in land use, there's all sorts of different um, you know, tools you know, at, 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 at these installations disposal. Um, but definitely installations are beginning like a commun any community or a small community, you know, there's steps in the process and there's a plan that needs to be sort of laid out and, and then you're really looking for where, where do you have these mechanisms or these opportunities to, to implement some of these strategies. So another resource, and, and this resource was just released. Um, it was uh, created for naval installations, but I would find it would, I would think that it'd be very useful uh, for others at, at the coastal community level or a planner for that matter. Um, it walks you through the process, and, and Brian mentioned some of this. It walks through, walk, has step by step. Uh, questions and answers and spreadsheets and um, questionnaires that can help you through the cost-benefit analysis, looking at alternative strategies or solutions or alternatives, um, helps you to identify, you know, the design life or of the intended decision you're making or, or you know, I use, you know, if, if you're planning a, a passive pier or a dock and, and the, your length of your investment is really only intended to be in place for 20 years, you may not need to think about sea level rise. If you're planning, you know, a much larger uh, piece of infrastructure at a higher cost and it's intended to be in place for 50 years, that's when you need to, to plan uh, for some of these longer term impacts. So I would just uh, urge folks to take a look at this planning handbook. It's very useful. That's all I have. Any questions? Um, at the Naval Academy? Um, definitely, I mean, we haven't reached that stage of, of a plan, but there are definitely uses and changes in uses um, that you know, could, could be considered. Um, from a planning perspective, but but that's not that's not something that's being considered at this time. I saw where it looks like after Isabel, the naval academy has rebuilt like that seawall on the seven. So, is that sort of the approach that you would take going forward, or would you also think about an alternative, like you know, we heard how things like the seawall can <coughs> magnify the impact of the Right. So I think that the plan for the Sea Level Rise Advisory Council is working through kind of the short, medium, and long-term solutions. So relocation, you know, 300 years from now may be, may be something, you know, but right now it's really to protect the assets that, that are there. And so structural solutions and maintaining um, the infrastructure on the lower yard is, is, a, is a priority. Um, so there is some repair and replacement of, of seawalls going on, but they're also looking at um, a natural solution. So on Greenberry Point on the North Severn side, there have been some natural uh, shore protection practices. So where they can use natural protection, um, they, they you know, will go that route. But it's definitely, you know, laying, the, I think from, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I've just started. So um, it's really to, to think about, you know, the point of my presentation is that with any installation, there's a planning process and you need to sort of walk through what your short, medium, and long-term, what your vulnerability is, what those short, medium, and long-term solutions are, what the, where are those mechanisms, when you can begin to implement those. Um, so it's, it's a very comprehensive planning process. So in the end, you know, the decisions that are made, you know, are, are, are you know, those, those we, we end up implementing, but 
from a planner's perspective, it's just the installation is just like any plan in any place that you would do, you know, um, place-based planning. 